you were here last week, uh, Pastor Mark, as Randy alluded to, kind of started us on this new journey as we're going through the Sermon on the Mount, and um, he kind of wanted us to, uh, to kind of get this context, as he said, to kind of wrap our heads around really what's happening and where it was happening and, and some of the details surrounding it, and um, we're a detailed kind of person. I am. I know Mark is as well, and context, context, context is something that I learned early on in the seminary and Bible classes that I took, that you really need to understand those things to really understand the whole story, and so Mark did a super job just kind of uh, helping us to understand a little bit of that um, context. What makes a Sermon on the Mount such a great sermon is that, number one, it was given by Jesus himself. Some of you were listening, and so that's great. Um, it's also a sermon on the mount because we believe it was given on a mount, as it even tells us that in the first verse, right, that Jesus went up on a mountain um, and then began to give his sermon on the mount. Um, as Mark even shared with us that at this time in Jesus' ministry, it's kind of towards the beginning of his ministry, crowds are picking up, crowds are gathering. I love that map that Mark showed us that just kind of helps you to understand how quickly word is getting out about this new guy in town who's coming with a new message. And as Jesus is proclaiming his message, people are literally coming by the droves. Thousands and thousands of people everywhere that Jesus went, they're following Jesus. Some of the reason why they're following him is because his message is so different. His message is so new. His message is countercultural to definitely their time, definitely countercultural to our time. But we could also say it was, it was counter religious. Uh, the religious leaders, he would you know, flip them over on their heads as well, as much of what he was saying would kind of throw a little bit of a loop for them. And so this is kind of the upside down message that Jesus is giving. And I'll be honest, as we begin to work through this, that you're going to find out that this is an upside down message for you. Just as it kind of stirred and kind of um, created quite a bit of reaction among the people who were there listening in that day, and it continued on, you're going to find that it's going to stir and um, kind of create a reaction among you and I. And I think that's part of Jesus' point, is to create a bit of a reaction to get a stir from us as we today are his listeners. And today, we're just really going to spend some time unpacking one verse. And I know like, yes, we're getting out early. Well, you know how that goes for me. One verse <laughs> can be big. And so, but we're pretty much going to focus on that one verse. And uh, Lisa already read that, but we want to go back and we want to read um, kind of those three again as we understand what that main verse is, looking at verses one and two that we uh, touched on last week. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And here's the verse we're going to look at. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When I was in seminary, I was introduced to an author and a theologian. His name is Dallas Willard. Some of you may be familiar with Dallas. I'm not sure if you are or not, but he passed away uh, several years ago. Um, our cohort of 30 other pastors and ministry leaders and missionaries who I was kind of journeying with as we were in seminary together, um, we had the opportunity to actually talk to Dallas, and it was kind of a highlight of that class as, as he was able to share with us personally about ministry as we were kind of talking about this idea of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. And this week I was reminded, as I was just listening to a multiple, a barrage of different commentators and pastors and just trying to just get my head in, in the game here and really what's happening within this one verse, I was reminded of a book that he wrote called The Divine Conspiracy. Towards the end, uh, or towards the beginning of that book, he kind of shares a story. And by the way, the whole book really, is, in essence, is about the Sermon on the Mount. And he takes kind of verse by verse and kind of works you through the entire Sermon on the Mount in his book, and it's called um, Discovering Our Hidden Life in God. And here he kind of talks about how it was for him as he was growing up in the early part of the 20th century in a rural part of Missouri, he says, where he says electricity was available only in the form of lightning. <laughs> I like that. Um, he says that when he was in his senior year of high school, the REA, or the electrical company of his day, which was Rural Electrification Administration, um, extended their electric lines into the area where Dallas and his family lived. And electrical power became available to households and to farms like his families. He says um, when those electrical lines came by his farm, a very different way of living life presented itself. Our relationship to fundamental aspects of life, he says, will never be the same again. Daylight and dark, hot 
and cold, clean and dirty, work and leisure, preparing food and preserving it, all of these aspects of life will now be changed forever because electricity is coming to town, right? And in so many ways, the REA, the electrical company of the time, said, repent of your ice boxes and your kerosene lamps and your lanterns, for a whole new way of living life is now being offered to you. A life marked by electricity is now available to you. And for the most part, people jumped on it, and they repented of this former way of life, and they tapped in to this new thing called electricity. Maybe some of you remember these days. I don't know how old we go, but anyways. Um, and sure enough, it was life-changing for Dallas and his family and many others. But then he says, oddly enough, not everyone was on board. And they said, thanks, but no thanks. This electricity thing, I don't really dig it right now. And I'm good with the way my life is, and I'm good with my kerosene lamps and ice boxes. And even though this whole new way of life was offered to them, they were completely content with living life according to the old way. And thus, many chose not to enter the kingdom of electricity. Some just didn't want to change, and others just couldn't afford it, or at least they thought they couldn't afford it. And they said, you know what? I'm done. I don't need that, and I'm not even going to work for it. And tragically, this is so true for so many people in our world today. And you know we're not talking about electricity, although there are many places that are, don't have that, we know. But I'm talking today about a whole new way of life that Jesus has come to give us, that Jesus is beginning to share with us in his Sermon on the Mount. We looked at this last week, but when Jesus shows up on the scene in the New Testament, he again is fresh in the beginning of his ministry, and he comes announcing this new kingdom, not electricity, but the new kingdom of heaven has arrived. Pastor Mark took us on this journey, um, kind of bringing us through, even through Matthew 4, when Jesus would be actually, literally first began his ministry, and immediately he was sent out to the wilderness, right? And he was tested by the devil himself. And so we, we kind of learned a little bit about some of those little details that he shared with us. And then from that moment on, Scripture says that he began to preach. And he comes with this new message, and this is what he says in Matthew 4, 17, and this was read to us last week. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. By the way, right after this, he calls his first disciples, and so he is like moving, right? Ministry starts, he's baptized as an example, and he, he's immediately whisked away, and he's tested as he's um, now on this, um, this fasting period within his life, and he's seeking the Father's will and wisdom, and then from here, he begins to preach his, this new message, and he begins to call his disciples and his own followers, and here we are. And Jesus says, repent, this means to turn from your old way and to turn to this new way that he is guaranteeing us. And no, this new way is not a problem-free kind of life. We wish it worked like that, didn't we? We trust Jesus, and from that moment on, life is great, no problems. But unfortunately, you and I still live in a sin-filled, broken world where broken people and hurt people hurt people, and we understand that this is often how the world works. But Jesus is on this this plan, God is on this plan to begin to put things back together, and one day things are going to be restored wholly when heaven becomes a reality for us. But Jesus says this new way of life that is offered through the kingdom of heaven is a life that is ultimately so rewarding, a life that is full, a life that is filled with meaning, a life that is filled full with, with value and significance, and he says, and it's here. You can tap into that. You can have this kind of life. And again, tragically, just as physically we learned people who turned electricity down spiritually, there are many today who are turning down Jesus' personal offer for this new way of life. I know people like this. You know people like this. You may be a person like this. For some reason, maybe you're here today and you're kind of wrestling with this idea of who Jesus is. I'm not sure. Maybe you're here in our midst today. And some people that I know, it's as if they're saying thanks, but no thanks. I'm good with living my kingdom my way on my terms and I don't need his 
right now. What a sad tragedy. And Jesus says, I have this whole new way of living, and I'm making it available to you, and people are turning him down. As we set out together on this new journey, studying Jesus' sermon here, the Sermon on the Mount, we're going to discover that Jesus is going to show us what the new powerful way of the kingdom looks like, and how you and I can, can actually tap into that power, and we can experience it now. The kingdom of heaven, as Mark even shared with us, is not just a distant reality, although that is a part of it, right? It's already, but not yet. We can experience that power now, but one day in a fuller reality, we can experience the kingdom of heaven one day. And here, Jesus is actually telling us that we can tap into this and that you and I can actually live this out in our life right now. But I need to warn you as we begin to go on this journey, it's going to hurt. This one is going to hurt. So I said it, you've been warned, go ahead and write it down, it's going to hurt, and hopefully you're still going to hang in there with me and you're not going to leave. But I think if you're breathing today, if you're a human being today, if you're at all open to the soft-spoken word of the Holy Spirit, you will feel the need, in essence, to drop to your knees and crawl to your Savior this morning. You will be brought up short as you face the truth of what Jesus is going to share with us today. And my prayer is that his message will penetrate our hearts, that it will refresh our view of our need for him, and that it will lift us out of our mediocrity that so often that you and I as Christians today settle for. I also need to warn you that there is one phrase that that I think we could use to summarize. I'm kind of stealing this with the, the multiple sources that I researched this week, and I, I'm, I'm going to kind of summarize this part of the Sermon on the Mount in really with using these words, impossibly Christian. How's that for an encouraging message? Impossibly Christian. I feel the need to warn you because when you and I begin to read the Sermon on the Mount, you're going to have this sense of feeling just flat out overwhelmed. You're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to read so many things in this sermon, and we're going to walk away saying, I just can't do this. It's just impossible. For example, we will eventually study together in Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. We will eventually get to this. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. What in the world is Jesus saying here? If you're, if you're at all familiar with the Pharisees, they're the poster children of piety. In fact, the very word Pharisee comes from a Hebrew word that means separated. So they were holy and mighty and separated from everybody else because they believed that they had it all under control. But at the same time, they were devoted to observing the 613 laws and rituals They were leaders in the synagogues. They accepted the written word as the inspired word of God, and that's a great thing. But unfortunately, the Pharisees even added to this their their oral traditions, and they gave it an equal authority to God's written tradition. But these Pharisees were people who memorized the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And what does Jesus say? I tell you, unless you Unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, count me out. You feel overwhelmed? What about this one? We'll eventually come to this one in our study on the Sermon on the Mount, verse 20 and 22 of 5. You have heard that it was said to me, people long ago, you shall not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, raka, or it's this idea of foolish or stupid, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Who here isn't guilty of that? You might say, I get angry all the time with my fellow brothers and sisters. In fact, I got a few on my list, right? We create lists who we still haven't forgiven them because of what they've done for us. And Jesus says, if that's you, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of heaven. And then he says, you fool, you'll be in danger of the fire of hell itself. Who here isn't guilty of that? You feel overwhelmed? You see, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is, 
is not just countercultural, it's also counter to even the most faithful religious leaders of Jesus' time and what they were saying. And I would say even in our time, it's counterculture to the day and age that you and I live in. And we feel overwhelmed. And Jesus, there's no way that I can do this. Well, what about this one? This one will actually get to this one too on another distant Sunday morning. And it says this, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. We actually, not too long ago, actually studied this as a a few verses together. Do you feel overwhelmed when we read this one? Jesus, you want me to love my enemies? On top of that, you want me to pray for my enemies? There's no way that I can do this. Well, here's another one that we'll look at in verse 27 and 28. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And all the men say, what? We're guilty. We could even add to that. I think we could add to that and kind of bring in some fair game here. What if Jesus would say, I I tell you that any woman who even looks at a man lustfully, right? You feel overwhelmed? Recently, my wife and I were um, talking about the dangers of social media. And this is nothing new. You already know this. But we were just kind of talking about how You have to be so careful what your little eyes see. You know, you can be searching for a recipe on Pinterest for chicken Milanese and then come across an image that has nothing to do with chicken, right? And you're like, where in the world did this come from, right? How did I get there? And in just a matter of seconds, you know how it is, I don't have to tell you that, but in a matter of seconds, you can be propositioned to stare at an image for as long as you want. And temptation comes. Suddenly, all of us are counting ahead to this week. I'm not showing up for that week, for sure. (laughs) And you're like, how do you think I feel when i got to preach about these things? That's the problem with doing a series like this is you can't push aside the verses that you don't want to deal with. I'm going to have to deal with this one sooner or later, and you better come on that Sunday as well. (laughs) So we prepare to study this Sermon on the Mount, and it should be this warning label. It's an impossible standard. And you will experience this overwhelming sense of this is impossibly Christian. Another author that I've looked at this week is theologian D.A. Carson, and this is what he says about the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, and this whole series, he says this, and nevertheless, I insist that if the Sermon on the Mount be construed merely as legal requirement to kingdom entrance, no one shall ever enter. Can anyone meditate long on Matthew 5 through 7 and remain unashamed? We just meditated on just four examples, right? And we already feel like trash, right? The Sermon on the Mount provides us with a crushing blow to self-righteousness and follows it up with an invitation to petition God for favor, without which there can be no admittance to the kingdom. At the same time, it sketches in the quality of life of those who do enter, those who petition God, ask for forgiveness, and who by God's grace discover not only forgiveness but a growing personal conformity to kingdom norms. It is not long before their own lives begin to sum up the law and the prophets. What I'm learning here and what I think D.A. Carson is trying to tell us is that Jesus wants us to feel overwhelmed. He wants you to feel overwhelmed. Not overwhelmed in the sense that we throw up our hands in despair and we turn our backs on God and we walk away, but He wants us to feel overwhelmed, this prevailing sense of, I can't do this, it's just impossible. Not that we would turn from Him, but He wants us to feel overwhelmed so that we would turn to Him. This is what He wants, our only hope that we sang about this morning. We can't do this stuff on our own, and this is why we need a Savior. And this is the entire punchline of the gospel. It's the entire punchline, I think, of the Sermon on the Mount. It's the brutal truth that I can't, I can't, I can't, that leads us to our saving grace and praise God that He can, He can, He can, right? And so if you're feeling overwhelmed... I say welcome to the Sermon on the Mount. And my opinion is, this is exactly where Jesus wants you. 
I love the way Chris kind of worded uh, that when he kind of shared about his life group. And th- that's a true story, what he shared. He came to us and he, he said, it's like, Pastor, I, I can't do this. There is no way that I can lead a life group. I just don't feel qualified. And I'm like, that's exactly the person that I want. We want a person who's on their knees who can't do it. And then he'll tap into the power of the Holy Spirit. And then with that power, he'll be able to do it. And so Chris, we're like, you're already on the team, bud. You're here whether you like it or not. That's what we want, people who can't do it. So I appreciated his humbleness. And so if you're feeling overwhelmed, again, this is right where Jesus wants you. Because it's when we are at our lowest, we can look to the highest, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is telling us and will continue to teach us in this series, if, if you feel overwhelmed and maybe mistreated and your anger meter is pegged, we just read that one, right? Come to Jesus. If you're overwhelmed by the fact that your so-called friends have now become enemies and are hurting you, come to Jesus. If you're battling lust in your life and you are overwhelmed with the grip that it has, come to Jesus. And on and on and on, Jesus will teach us these powerful truths of how you and I can tap into the power of a new life. There's a total of eight Beatitudes that we'll look at. Today we look at the first one. The first four really have to do with our relationship with God vertically. So I want you to think about this. Out of the eight Beatitudes that Lisa already read for us, out of those eight, the first four have to do with our relationship with God vertically. The second four have to do with our relationship with others horizontally. I love how Jesus kind of writes his sermon. I mean, he's a, he's a pastor's friend because he just makes it so simple for us, but yet it's really not simple. But I love the way he lays those things out. So the first four, vertical. The second four will be horizontal as we look at how it affects our relationship with other people. Each of these eight we will discover build upon the other so that there is this amazingly beautiful and compelling kind of progression as we read along through all eight. So today we start with this first one, and I do have to tell you that you have to get this one down. If you don't get the first one down, the other sevens won't make sense. If you don't get the first one down, you're going to flunk the test for the rest of the seven, and I don't want anybody to flunk, all right? So we've got to get this first one down. We can't get it wrong. Many people, I think, misunderstand the Beatitudes, and thus, as a result, have experienced much pain and confusion. I heard about a story of a pastor who um, was sharing on the Beatitudes, and after he was done, a lady in his congregation came to him and said, just so you know, the Beatitudes was the reason that my son checked out of faith because he didn't feel like he could do it, right? Well, he didn't understand. He didn't understand. And so we have to understand what the Beatitudes mean. Um, We we can't uh, allow this confusion to mess us up. So strangely enough, the blesseds have not uniformly been a blessing to some, but that's not going to be the case in our church, right? We want to be able to understand what these mean. We need to understand that the Beatitudes, these 10 verses that we'll look at, um, these are not things that we do in order to get into the kingdom of heaven. If so, that we would call that works salvation, right? We know that that doesn't work, that you and I can't earn our salvation. We can't earn God's favor. That's why it's called grace. Grace is something that's given to you that you don't deserve, but he gave that to you. And so that's not what Jesus is talking about. A list of things that you and I have to do in order to be good enough, in order to get to heaven. We don't perform well, and as Christians, we often mess up, and so that's not the case because all of us would be destined for hell if that was the case. The Beatitudes are also not a list of things we must do in order to um, comfort ourselves, or maybe, maybe it's a personal moral code, and we want to add to this a, a list of other moral things that we can do, and it's just our good behavior and our adherence to morality, and that's not the case, right? We can't earn God's favor in those things, and so it's not a list of do's and don'ts that we can do, so don't look at it as this list of do's and don'ts that if you fail, then you're done, Um, we'll look at the appropriate way that we can look at these things. These Beatitudes are Jesus' own specifications of what every Christian ought to be. We should look like these things. These 
Beatitudes should be the clothing that you and I put on every single morning because the world needs people who are living these kinds of truths out in their life. In fact, throughout our series, we'll see that these Beatitudes will stand in stark contrast to the kingdom of the world. That's why often people say Jesus' message is just so flat out upside down because in our day today, these Beatitudes, would you agree, are very hard to find. They're rare in our day today. Here we just look at this eight really quickly just by different words that maybe we've uh, chosen. And you'll see here on the list we have on the left side, we're going to have the kingdom of the world. On the right side, we'll have the, the kingdom of God. And we'll just kind of look at these lists as they come in. And so the world there, it looks at pride. God says humility. That's the first one that we'll look at today. We'll eventually come to these next seven, revelry versus mourning. The world says oppress, oppressive use of power. And God says meekness, hunger for personal gratification, and Jesus says hunger for righteousness. The world says it's all about being vindictive, and Jesus says no, it's all about being merciful. The world says it's all about having a hidden agenda just to crawl your way to the top, and Jesus says no, it's about purity of heart. The world says it's about being divisive. Who cares about other people? Just do what you need to do. And Jesus says, no, it's about being a peacemaker. The world says it's about acceptance. I'll do what I need to do in order for people just to accept me and accept who I am. And and Jesus says, no, it's about persecution. You'll do what's best. And sometimes as a result, you'll be persecuted for that. When we each wear the clothing of the Beatitudes, there is something about you and I that will stand out in our world today. I promise you, you will stand out. This week, I heard an example of another pastor, and this one just resonated with me because pastor's jokes and stories are just, I don't know, I'm a pastor, so it makes sense, but he was talking about how he's on his way to a wedding, and this happens to me as well. Um, often, I'm, I'm dressed up, and I'm going somewhere. I'm either going to a funeral or going to a wedding and wearing a suit or something like that, um, and this particular pastor was in a rural part of town, and he kind of had to stop to get gas, and he got out, and as he's filling his car with gas, he's looking around, and everybody else is wearing shorts and tank tops and t-shirts, and here he is dressed up, suited and booted, ready to go for the day, right, for his wedding that was just a few hours down, and everybody's looking strangely at him like, what's this guy all about? And he just wanted to tell them, I know I look strange, but look, I'm not dressed for where I'm at, I'm dressed for where I'm going, And this is what the Beatitudes do in our life. We are wearing the apparel of another world, and as Christ followers, we are choosing to wear these beautiful attitudes, as I like to call them, in our world. And as a result, you will naturally stand out because you're dressed for not where you are. You're dressed for where you're going. When we live out these truths, we're wearing the eternal reality in the kingdom of this world As Jesus says, God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You and I are to bring these kinds of truths to the world because the world so uh, desperately needs it. So we come to this first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In the original language of the New Testament, which most of us know is in Greek, Matthew records for us this first beatitude, kind of using some very interesting words. The word blessed cannot simply be reduced to mean happy. Last week, you learned some of that as well. That's a, kind of a, a poor um, way of defining it, and it's, it's, um, it's a, we can't just reduce it to mean happy, although those who are blessed will be happy. Jesus tells us that, but we can't just reduce it to mean that. In Scripture, man can bless God, and we read that, but at the same time, we read that God can also bless man. To be blessed means fundamentally to be approved, to find approval. And since this is God's universe, there can be no higher blessing than be, to a, than, than be approved by God. Would you agree? Uh, Max Lucado, author, says, um, he say he calls this blessedness the applause of heaven. I love that, the way he says that, the applause of heaven. In fact, as I thought about that, we really must ask ourselves, whose blessing Whose applause are you and I really after? Whose approval are we after? Do you seek the applause or approval of man, or do you seek the applause or approval of God? What's more important for you? That's the word blessed. 
or blessed. Now, the word for poor, or as in poor in spirit, it's a word that doesn't really speak of our condition per se, but rather it speaks of our posture. So don't think our condition, think of our posture. And the word in the original language leads us to believe what Jesus was trying to get across. It's the word petohos. It's the transliteration of that word Greek. And it means one who cowers or crouches over like a beggar. So picture this in your mind. Picture a beggar who's cowering over, who's crouches over. It means one who is hunched over. It's a word that speaks of a person's disposition, a word that was used to describe those who are soliciting money. He cannot survive. A beggar cannot survive without help from the outside. That's the posture that the poor in spirit have. You're saying, I cannot survive without the help from the outside. And that outside is Jesus. And the same is true for you and I, this idea, this spiritually speaking as it is physically speaking as with a beggar. And Jesus goes on to say, it's not blessed are those who are poor in finances. And some of you are like, well, if that was the case, then I'd be highly favored, right? Because that's me, right? But it's not that, it's, it's poor in spirit, So he's saying what one of my resources said this week, and I'm going to use these words to help us understand, is it's having a disposition of desperation. So it's not our condition, it's more our posture. It's a disposition of desperation. It is the innermost person of who I am, this constant reminder of my extreme neediness, When we think of those who are poor, they are in tune with their neediness, right? They are utterly destitute. One commentator said, it's the background elevator music of their soul. I am needy, I am needy, I am needy. I have some friends who are alcoholics. I'm sure many of you have friends who are alcoholics. Um, They say once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic, even if you're in sobriety. Um, Those of you who've been down that road, you understand Some of my friends, as I listen to them describe their addiction to alcohol and their journey of alcohol, um, maybe they went to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, or maybe they went to CR, which is Celebrate Recovery, kind of a a Christian um, way that uh, that we look at our hurts, habits, and hang-ups. And um, CR, Celebrate Recovery, the first step in CR says this, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. AA says in one of their documents, we perceive that only through utter defeat are we able to take our first step towards liberation and strength. In other words, people who come to AA or even CR for help, they have reached a point of desperation, right? We, so we hear there's even words that we use to describe it. Well, he's not at his bottom yet, right? Until he's the bottom of the barrel, you know, and so we use words like that. I am needy, I am needy, I am needy is what a person who deals with that kind of addiction is experiencing when they come to get help. And it's then and only then that they will begin to receive the strength and the help to begin their journey of sobriety, right? Those of you who've been there, you know that it's not until you are utterly desperate till real help can begin to take place. In a similar way, when a person is poor in spirit, they have come to a place of utter desperation, They have reached a disposition of desperation. They are a person who is acknowledging, in essence, that I am spiritually bankrupt. I have nothing on my own. I can't earn God's grace. I can't be good enough. And so they come hunched over, recognizing their neediness before our almighty God. And they cry out, oh Lord, I need you. I need you. I need you. And then and only then, Will you be able to receive the grace and the help that you need in order to live in the kingdom of heaven? But first, you and I must come in desperation. And I believe this is exactly what Jesus was trying to get across. I wish I could sit down with him and ask him, Jesus, just kind of tell me straight up, what exactly were you talking about? I think he makes it pretty clear for us, though, in his sermon As we are overwhelmed by his words, we come to find out about our utter desperation. And so we say, Jesus, I can't do this, but I know you can. 
Jesus, I'm perpetually needy within my life. I can't live a life that honors God within my own power and strength. I can't do the things that are countercultural to my world. I can't put on these beautiful attitudes every single day of my life within my own strength. I just can't do it. And when we reach this point within our life, what does Jesus say about those people? We just read it. What does Jesus say about those people? Jesus calls them blessed. Blessed. He says, you have the applause of heaven. He says, when, when you get to that point of desperation, where you are on your knees crawling to the Savior, you have the applause of heaven. So as we are overwhelmed by his words, we come to to him out of desperation. Two weeks ago, I was watching live news, as many of the world was watching live news, as a young football player for the Buffalo Bills, you know the story, Um, DeMar Hamlin collapsed on the field. As he experienced, uh, his heart literally stopped, cardiac arrest, his heart stopped on the field for the watching world. Medical professionals were performing CPR live on the field for the watching world and for the watching players of both sides, and all they could do was get on their knees and watch. And I thought to myself, isn't it interesting, as I began to observe the actions of the players and the people in the stands, it's very interesting that everybody was suddenly, within seconds, in an utter place of desperation. Did you sense it? There was desperation. A massive arena filled with thousands and thousands of people, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody knew what to do. It was desperation. And so I thought it's interesting that in a world that so often wants to push God to the side, suddenly, what do we do? We all cry out to God because we think God can help us in our time of desperation. I watched the next day as an ESPN Sports analysis prayed on his show, NFL Live, live in front of the watching world. He prayed. And at the time, I was thinking about this idea of what it means to be poor in spirit, and I don't know about you, but I had this sense that the world, the world for, for one time at least, was in a place, that was in a disposition of desperation. And this sports analysis, this former football player himself, he knows how it works. His prayer was so humble and real. And he just prayed, oh God, we need you. And so with a posture of being hunched over, I just had this sense that so many people were were coming in desperation before God. Now, I don't know how many people's lives were seriously changed. I don't know how many people that through that experience that maybe was a little bit of a wake-up call for them and they started to think about, wow, you know, maybe there is a God I don't know. I have a feeling that there probably is many people who was a bit of a wake-up call for them as they think about the brevity of life. The word blessed is also this Greek word, makareos. One of its meanings is the state of being marked by fullness. The state of being marked by fullness. Now, look at the contradistinction here as you think about these two words. Poor in spirit is being what? empty of everything. And here Jesus says, when that happens, there's fullness. There's there's this play on words that we see. In other words, the upside down distinction of the kingdom means we will only get to fullness when we first experience emptiness. Isn't this exactly what the world says? The world says you need more things You need to to fill your life with more things and more money and more relationships and more degrees and more status and more and more and more. And so you fill your life with these things and then you'll experience the fullness of life. That's what the world says. But Jesus says, and the Beatitudes will teach us that it's an upside down kingdom. Jesus says the way to true fullness is through a disposition of desperation It's really the idea of, I'm understanding this, of humility. It's this idea of humility. The way up is down. To be hunched over, spiritually speaking, constantly in tune of our need for a 
a Savior, reminding ourselves daily that I can't do this on my own. Oh, Lord, I need you. It's when we live outside of ourselves for something greater than ourselves that Jesus says, then at that point, life will become full. Life will become fulfilling. In this first beatitude, I don't know if you see this connection, but I hope that you do because we're going to park here for a second. But this first beatitude, there's this connection with humility and some things that I'm learning as I'm researching here for myself. And it's this idea that we are called to mimic Jesus. It's this idea that we are to put on the clothing of humility to empty ourselves in order to mimic Christ. I'm so glad that 2,000 years ago that God peered over the balcony of heaven, right, and saw us in desperation heading down a one-way road destined for hell. And God sent His Son, and in the greatest act of humility that the world ever saw, Jesus Christ on the cross offered His life. He sacrificed on our behalf. He emptied Himself on our behalf. And we are here today, forgiven today, loved today, all because of the humility and sacrifice of Jesus. And to be a follower of His, Jesus says, I just want you to put on these kinds of beautiful attitudes within your life because the world needs people like you. The world needs people to put these kinds of beautiful attitudes on display. But we admit that this is so incredibly difficult for us, isn't it? This idea of humility itself, this first one, I think is the most difficult one. And again, if we don't get this one down, we won't get the rest of the seven because the downward gravitational pull of our hearts is pride. Humility is not something that you and I have on a regular basis within our vocabulary, right? It's just not a word that we want to use very much if we're just being real humans. And pride is where we're often pulled, and the great enemy to the virtue of humility is the vice of pride. If humility is emptiness, then pride is self-sufficiency, self-fulfillment. If humility is to have a disposition of desperation, then pride is to be full of oneself. If humility is dependence upon God, which by the way, that's one of our values as a church, right? We are a church who is God-dependent. So if humility is dependence on God, then pride is independence. Pride is what evicted Adam and Eve from the garden. Pride is what led to Judas' betrayal of Jesus. Pride is the cause of death for so many marriages that you and I have observed. Pride is the cause of destruction for many relationships. It's the sin beneath all sins is pride. Sins like gossip or lying or adultery, etc., are mere symptoms of a much greater problem, and that problem is the problem of sin. And the opposite of that, pride, is humility, and Jesus hits that one first. Because you've got to lose your pride and empty yourself in order to come before a holy God. This week I came across a little test, and we're going to kind of use this test to kind of wrap up our time, and then I'm going to read one passage after this. And so we're going to just take a quick pride litmus test because I think we need some application here that's going to help us. And so um, answer these questions, either yes or no, and then keep score. If you're having trouble keeping score, ask your spouse. I'm sure he or she will love to help you, okay? Um, <laughs> number one, are you easily offended? Okay, number one, are you easily offended? In regards to pride... I heard this week that it is almost impossible to offend a humble person. Why? Because they don't lead with their rights. They're too consumed with other people to be worried about being offended by someone's words. Ouch, that one's powerful. Yes or no? Number two, are you a people pleaser? You struggle to say no, not because you're just being a nice guy, but because you want them to think well of you. And so the more you say yes, the more that you're racking up some, you know, some social points here because you need that and you want to feel important and say so you can't say no. Yes or no? <laughs> can't say no. Yes or no? Number three, are you a timid person? This one kind of threw me for a loop when I found this test because I'm like, what? How, how does this work? And uh, so it's tricky, but maybe you're so timid that you will not confront other people. 
So this could be on a confrontational basis. By the way, anybody who enjoys confrontation is just weird. Um, nobody enjoys confrontation, but you, you know where I'm going with this. Timidity is actually a face of pride. Why? Because the timid person won't confront because they're too worried about the other person not really liking you. Pride. So you won't confront and won't talk about what needs to be talked about because you're afraid that they won't like you anymore. Number four, do you rarely apologize? It's a tough one too. You may know you're wrong, but the words I'm sorry never make it out of your esophagus, right? So is that you? Are you a person who you don't say you're sorry very often? Ask your spouse. Humble people apologize frequently. Prideful people don't. Why? Because they never see themselves as being wrong. And I'm not talking about, well, I'm sorry you misunderstood me. That's a good one. I'm sorry you were so offended. That's pride. Um, and you're using those you words, maybe flip it around and use some I words in there and say you're sorry. It takes a humble person to own their wrong and to openly confess they're wrong to another person, right? Number five, you always bring the conversation back to you. Um, there it is, back to you. This one, um, it, this is a safe place. I'm just being real. I, I struggle with this one. I love stories. So when someone comes to me and says, yeah, this week I had this surgery, and I'm like, really, really? Well, hey, I had a gallbladder removed like 10 years ago. Man, it, you know, try to one-up the story, right? We like to do that, don't we? Because we like to bring the conversation back to me. Right? Do you struggle with prayer? Are there many days in your life where you go on and on and on without praying and all of a sudden it hits you one day, wow, I haven't, I haven't approached his throne in a long time. A prayerless life is a prideful life. One author says prayer is the expression of the soul's dependence upon God which means prayer is a mark of humility and prayerlessness is a mark of pride. Prayerlessness says, I got this. I don't need you, God. I'm already full. What are we learning about what Jesus says about humility? What are we learning about what Jesus says about this posture? See the pride? Number seven, I don't struggle with any of these. If you believe that you don't struggle with any of these, then you are a prideful person. <laughs> I'll make it easy for you. You don't even have to add up your scores. If you answered yes to even one of these questions, then you are guilty of, you got it, pride. We're all guilty of pride. It's the sin beneath all sins. You talk about the issues in your life that maybe you're struggling with right now. Chances are you can go back, follow the path, and it's pride that started it all. It's ugly, and you're to rear its ugly head in our life if we're not careful. I want to close by simply reading a passage of Scripture from Philippians chapter 2. Uh, this passage has been um, a go-to passage for me for many, many years. You've heard us read this passage before. It's one that I've known and love. And I just want to encourage you, as I call up the um, praise team with us, today we're just going to close by singing two songs and songs that we've chosen that we think are going to be encouraging um, to you and to your hearts. And I want you to look at the screen, really, as we process everything and what we learned today about having this disposition of desperation. It's more of a posture, not a condition. That it's about coming before our Savior in utter desperation, saying, Oh God, oh God, I can't, I can't, I can't. But I know you can, you can, you can. Listen to Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2 to the church of Philippi. Absolutely beautiful. As he reminds us of the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests 
of others, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But get this, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father. Will you just um, take a moment in silence and reflect on his sacrifice for us as we prepare to sing this morning? And maybe there's some things that you need to get right with the Lord, and we'll just give you a little bit of time to do that. As we humbly come with this disposition of desperation before our Savior.